were you ever in danger? Did you ever feel in danger yourself? Sure. I mean, in some ways, every minute I was there, I felt in danger. For me, the real fear was not so much a, an, a bomb or an IED going off or getting caught in crossfire, because that almost felt like just occupational hazard. And if it happens, it wasn't your day. And we, we all were willing to go out and take that risk. It was kidnapping. The Daniel uh, Pearl. Yeah, it was being psychologically and physically tortured, you know, in public view on the internet, on the web, and then killed. And just the, the, the fear of the aloneness of those last that days and hours of one's life um, spent in the hands of people who um, had no concern whatsoever. That, that was terrifying. And there were times when I could have easily been kidnapped, a f flat tire on the wrong stretch of highway, that kind of thing. So those were the bad moments. The dominant feeling I got reading The Assassin's Gate was that um, you met a lot of good people trying to do good things with very little, or in some instances, no resources. Uh, I know that there are some who look at the situation and think that there are evil people involved, but you found some, some wonderful people, and in fact, the characters drive the story of this, don't they? Yeah, I wanted to write this book um, in, the, in the model of a 19th century novel where the reader gets to know a handful of characters and watches their lives play out on this big historical stage as they pass in and out of the story and as the big events have an effect on their small lives. I was not so interested in the VIPs. I mean, I interviewed Bremer, I interviewed Condi Rice, but you don't get anything out of those interviews. What I really was interested in was the way more ordinary Americans and Iraqis, like um, a junior officer in the army or uh, a mid-level civilian official or uh, a young woman working at the university or a psychiatrist or a doctor, how they saw what was happening and especially how they each saw the other. I was always trying to figure out what did the Iraqis think of these people who had shown up in their country and what did the Americans think of this project that they had undertaken, you know, in many cases with, as you say, high ideals and which any thoughtful, sensitive person knew was going terribly wrong. And to watch people try to make sense of it and try to, to, to improve it when they were, in a sense, trying to dig their way out of a sand trap was humanly interesting. That was what interested me, was the, the, the psychology of, of the people involved, not, not so much the big policy questions. It's interesting. Everybody seems to be writing a book now d disavowing their uh, hmm. complicity. And, uh, you mean all the officials? Yeah. And yeah, those books are not worth the paper they're printed on. I have not yet read a book by a, a high official who really took a hard look at his own responsibility. Instead, it's past the buck time. And my guess is we're not going to get a book like that. I mean, Robert McNamara, you know, for all the scorn that should be heaped on him, did attempt to um, atone for his own terrible mistakes by looking hard at them. Maybe not hard enough, but he did look hard at them. I was told by a very smart man, this is not that kind of war. These are not that kind of pe officials. They are neoconservatives, and that means they are not going to look back and ask what they did wrong. They're going to look around for who stabbed them in the back. So when we get Rumsfeld's memoirs and when we get Cheney's memoirs, they're not going to have an ounce of self-criticism. That's my What do you think prediction. happened with Colin Powell? I mean, his testimony before the United Nations was pretty swaying. Oh, and I think that eats away at him every day. Do you? I do. I do. And I also think, I may be wrong, but I think Paul Wolfowitz is somewhat tormented as well. And it speaks a little better for them. I mean, I'd like to think that these guys are kept up at night. Um, you know, Colin Powell, you know, said after George Bush said he slept well after making the decision to go to war, he said uh, he slept like a baby. Colin Powell said, so did I. I woke up screaming every two hours. You know, that shows that Colin Powell knows something about what it meant to undertake this, this, you know, terribly risky thing. 
and the fact that his public posture has pretty much disappeared tells me that he is um, living with it. What's the future? You had predicted that uh, in this book that perhaps the, the escalating terrorism would drive the Iraqis towards their occupy, uh, you know, towards the Americans just for safety's sake. We see the surge. It seems to have had at least a temporary uh, calming effect. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we took away Iran's biggest enemy in Saddam Hussein, and some predict that it will be a Shia nation, a Shia region. I think what we have right now is a pause in what had become a civil war, and I, I think it's quite likely that it will resume. But the pause is important. I mean, it gives the Iraqi government the chance to make up for its own grievous errors. Um, I have a friend who I got to know over there, a reporter, who's back after two years. And he just has been emailing me daily telling me, you wouldn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's thousands of people out on the streets well after dark. Women are going around without the scarf. That means the fear of the armed gangs, and that's what they had become. It had become gang warfare, is, is much lower. And that's a really good thing. Um, I don't know that it's durable because the underlying political questions of basically whose country is it have not been answered. And you're not in favor of us pulling out anytime soon that it would cause more problems? <clears throat> I'm not in favor of a timeline because I think timelines um, are blind. You, you, what you need is a, is a withdrawal that is pegged to what's happening in certain parts of the country and what our needs are elsewhere, but not simply a blind withdrawal. Um, I was in favor of the surge. I was in Iraq when it started, and basically I, my feeling was um, this is better than nothing, and, and until now we've had nothing. So I thought it was a turn in the right direction. I also know that this is a war that is not sustainable. The American people will not allow it to be sustained. But do they... <clears throat> Do they care? Do they really seem to care? It seems that people, no. I mean, we don't have a draft, so it's selective who's going and who's dying. And it seems, at least from my talking to people, that it's kind of out there somewhere and there's a fatigue about it. And it, There is fatigue and there's been detachment from the beginning. I mean, this has been a war that has not involved the American people other than the, uh, the military and their families. I mean, the burden has been carried by a tiny fraction of the country. And I think in a sense that was part of the administration's strategy to basically let let us know that this wouldn't be all that costly and that strategy has backfired because now they've lost the support of people whose support they never really worked to get. There are so many conspiracy theories that float around especially in the Middle East you know and, and many and in this country and in too. this country too. Um, in your research and your conversations and your travels do any of them hold muster for instance that we went to war for oil? I don't think they stand up to scrutiny. I mean, um, oil may have motivated um, some people in the administration. It, it certainly may have motivated some of their friends in the private sector. But I think th this war was about power and ideas. This was an attempt to show the world, and especially the most volatile part of it, that the U.S. was not going to be uh, beaten and pushed around, that we were going to strike back. and remove people who were our enemies. And I think it was not a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, and in fact, if oil was the motive, it was a pretty bad decision because for years we poured money into the Iraqi um, oil economy and, and got very little back. And look at gas prices today. So what was the, what was the benefit to us in terms of oil, I think it's impossible to, to make a case for it. It's that kind of thinking, which you're right, is very widespread in the Middle East, and the including that we attacked our own World Trade Towers. Yeah, I, I mean, the internet has been a, a source of massive disinformation all across the world, um, not least in the Middle East. And yeah, I met people in Iraq every day who asked me if we had allowed the looting because. We wanted Iraq to destroy its own economy, et cetera. And I meet people in this country who are, are conspiracy-minded from the right and the left, whether it's we went to war for oil on the left or um, Barack Obama won't put his hand on the Bible when he takes the oath of office from the right. So it's, we have more and more information, and we seem to be less and less informed. 
and it's a, a paradox of you know the age of global media.